Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We serve a wonderful God who is perfect. And the more that we study Him in the Scripture, we see His great and abiding love. But the question is, how does one find themselves in a position where they can receive God's love? And there's only one answer to that question, and that is through a covenantal relationship. And when one enters into such a covenant, and for our conversation, we're speaking about a new covenant relationship. What Jeremiah taught in Jeremiah chapter 31, that not only spoke about God's faithfulness to maintain that covenant, but one of the chief parts of that covenant was God's perfect forgiveness. Forgiveness is so vital that we receive it, but also that we demonstrate forgiveness to others. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 18. The book of Matthew and chapter 18. Last week, we saw how serious it is if we behave in such a way that we become a negative influence on others, especially what the Bible speaks of little ones. And he may be meaning here a small child or someone who is immature in the faith. One of the things that God does, the Bible speaks about him edifying. That means building up. We can say it another way, that God matures his covenant people. He grows them and he does not like anything that stops or hinders or stunts that growth. So we need to be people that indeed play a positive role, have a godly influence on others, especially those who are young in the faith and small children. Well, we're going to begin, as I said, in this 18th chapter, where we left off last week. Look with me to verse, verse 10. Now, this is serious. We have just saw at the conclusion of last week's study that God reveals to us about a place that we know as hell, and he speaks of it in two ways. He speaks of it as fire and eternal fire. That is exactly what one normally thinks of when they think of hell that it's eternal punishment, it is fire and, as the word eternal teaches us, it goes on and on and on. And that is the eternal consequence for everyone who is not in a new covenant relationship with God by means of that only message of salvation. And I'm speaking of the gospel that focuses upon Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus Christ. So notice what he says here in verse 10. It begins with a command. He says, see, and he makes it very personal. He says, you see, and that means you be aware of this. You realize this biblical truth that God is giving humanity. He says, verse 10, you see that you do not despise, and this word despise means to give little consideration to, to think uh, not in an important way about something. Now, the word despise in English is a harsh word, and it does indeed speak to the significance of this Greek word. So do not think little of, do not treat as insignificant who? 
He says, you see, you be aware of this, that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven, and this is important, it teaches us a biblical truth. And that is that, that little ones, and if we take it to mean based upon context, that we're speaking about small children, it says that a small child, their angels, meaning this, that they have angelic protection, that God has released, he has commanded, he has sent angels in order to assist, protect, guard little children. And I personally believe that those angels are assigned specifically to an individual child, and those angels are with that, that individual when he's small and when he grows up. And there's a wonderful statement here as we continue reading. Once more, you see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that they're angels in heaven. And we have an expression meaning always. That's exactly how we should understand it. At all times. And what takes place among these angels at all times? Just keep reading. They see the face of my Father in heaven. Now, many of you know what's called the, the Birkat Kohanim. That is the priestly blessing that we read about, for example, in the book of Numbers chapter 6, towards the end of that, that chapter, where the Word of God says, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you. It also says, many translated differently, the Lord will lift up his face, his countenance unto you. And the point here is very simple. When there's that expression about finding God's face, remember what this is. This is the priestly blessing. So when the scripture says that their angels always find the face of my Father in heaven, it's saying this, that God always blesses the work of this angel. What he's doing, what those angels are doing in order to protect, guard, and, and lead these small children into safety. Why? So that ministry can be done, that they can be brought to faith or that they can grow in their faith, that they can be a valuable servant of the living God. So God blesses the angels of these small children in order that God's will will not be thwarted by the enemy or by any other influence in the world. Now look at verse 11. Verse 11 doesn't appear in all manuscripts, but in the Texas Receptus, the one that I use, that Greek text, it does. And it affirms something. Notice what it says, verse 11. For the Son of Man has come, that means he's entered into this word, he came. The Son of Man has come to save the lost. And, and I would do a good study of that word, the loss from a grammatical, grammatical standpoint. Why do I say that? Because it's very unusual. It is in the perfect tense. And what does that mean? Well, it speaks about a situation, a condition that's true in the past. It is still true in the present and it will go on into the future. And unless something is done, then that one is going to be eternally lost. And that's why what the scripture is saying is that's why Yeshua was sent into this world in order that he might save the ones who were lost, are lost, and will continue to be lost unless something changes that. And what is that? There's only one message of hope. There's only one thing that can change one from being lost to being found, and that is that wonderful gospel message of Messiah Yeshua that focus in on his death, that death on the cross, that he was buried and 
On the third day, he rose from the dead, signifying victory. And here's what's so important. Victory over death. And death is synonymous with sin. Therefore, through the ministry of the Son of Man, and I'm speaking about his spirit, what the Bible speaks of as the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit, when he's in your life and you are experiencing his anointing, his leadership, his ministry, you are going to find that you are going to persevere, you are going to endure, and you are going to accomplish the things of God. Well, let's press on to, to the next verse. Look, if you would, to verse, verse 12. Now he's going to give an example. And it's very important that we understand the culture. Because if we don't understand the culture, we're going to miss out on the real message of this, this type of parable. Although it's not called the parable, it is indeed an example of a parable. Look now to, to verse, verse 12. What do you think? He wants us to consider something. Now, remember, he's speaking to individuals that lived in that culture at that time. They understood many things that, that had been lost in, in our culture over the years. So he wants us to consider it from the right context. Once more, verse, verse 12, what do you think? If a man should have, and this is a certain man, doesn't matter who it is, a particular one of, of, of simply a human being, if a certain man, he has a hundred sheep, and one of them, and pay attention, this word for being astray, it's not going astray, but is led astray. Now, why would, would that sheep be led astray? Well, it's in the passive, which means that, that someone, something has acted in a way that has drawn that sheep, this one sheep, away from the flock. And this word for, for being led astray also relates to being deceived. So if one, this, this man, presumably we're talking about a shepherd, he has a hundred sheep, and one is deceived of them. Look now at the second part of verse 12. This is where the culture is so important. Because we read and it says, does he not leave the 99 upon the mountain? Now, some translation will say, does he not leave the 99 and goes to the mountain? That's not what it says. It says that he leaves the 99 upon the mountain. And it's put into a question as though, obviously, this is what the shepherd does. I would argue, based upon culture, that a shepherd would not make such a decision. Because even though that one who has been deceived, he is going to be presumably lost, being alone without the benefit of the shepherd, he is going to be devoured by some wolf, some animal that will prey upon him and he will be destroyed. But here's the key. When it says, does he not leave the 99? Most shepherd would not do that. Why does Messiah say it? Because he's the good shepherd. And the good shepherd is unique. And the reason why he's unique, we see this, for example, in John's gospel, because he is not like a hireling, because he loves the sheep, all of them. And it's that strong love for the sheep individually that causes him to leave the 99, take that very big risk in order to save that one. So when we read it, knowing the culture, when it says, does he not leave the 99 upon the mountain? Probably not. But the good shepherd does just that. And he goes seeking that one, and it says it again in the passive, that has been deceived. And if, look now to verse 13, and if he should find it, truly I say to you, that he rejoices concerning it more 
than concerning the 99 that were not deceived. Why? Because he was so grieved of that one that was deceived. Remember the context here. God hates, that's a very strong word, but it's appropriate. God hates deceit. He hates that improper influence that turns people away from the truth. Because when they go away from the truth, what happens to them? They find themselves in a very dangerous situation. And it's only a matter of time that they will encounter the enemy and that the outcome will be disastrous. So that's why, look at that verse, verse 11 where it says, the Son of Man, he has come to save the ones who are lost. He's that good shepherd. The one that's lost, even though it may be of great risk, he still goes after him, leaving the rest. Why? Because of this covenantal love. This is what the scripture is saying. Once more, we read, Truly, I say to you that he rejoices concerning it, this one that was found, more than concerning the 99 that were not deceived. Thus, now look at verse 14. Thus, it is not the will before your Father in heaven. Now, I want to emphasize because most translations do not. That it says before, that means under his domain, under his authority. It is not God's will. And this verse has such theological implications to it. We see something. This verse helps us understand the right view of God's sovereignty. God is always sovereign. But God being sovereign does not mean that he gets everything that he wants. Now, his will ultimately is going to be fulfilled for who? His covenant people. But God's will does not desire that anyone should be lost. Didn't we learn that? The Son of Man has come in order to save the lost. Not just some of the loss, but all. But there's parameters, there are rules, laws, spiritual laws that govern this. And therefore, look carefully at this text once more. He rejoices more for that one that was found than the 99 that, that were not deceived. Thus, verse 14, it is not the will of your heavenly Father before Him, your heavenly Father in heaven, in order that one of these little ones should perish, should be lost. And this word for perish means to be destroyed. Now, there's another very important passage. I began talking about forgiveness. And the reason why? Now we're going to speak about forgiveness. And one of the chief attributes of God is mercy. He is merciful. And that mercy brings about for you and me forgiveness. Without that forgiveness, we would have no hope. We would be eternally lost and we would spend forever and ever and ever in that eternal fire. But what does God do? He forgives us and He's commanding us that we need to be people as well who are forgiving. Look now to verse 15. But if your brother should sin against you, so he's guilty, he sinned against you, what should we do? Complain, speak uh, poorly of him, be, be seeking revenge? No, that's not what the scripture says. Messiah didn't treat us that way, and we're supposed to be like him. And therefore, if your brother should sin against you, go. And it literally means go away. And this implies that you have to go that, that extra mile, that it's an inconvenience, that it's going to take you out of where you naturally want to be, what's comfortable, what's easy for you. So he says, go away and, and hear this word, 
and reprove him. That is a word of conviction. Speak in a way that he will fall under, and hear this carefully, a godly conviction. Don't speak in a way that's going to push him away from, from the will of God, but speak in a way that will bring true conviction upon him. So he says, reprove him, and this should be done between you and him alone. Verse 15, the second part. If you, he hears, you have gained your brother. Wonderful. Verse 16. But if he should not listen, take with you more, one or two more. And the implication is alongside of you. In order that, and the next word is a word for a, a statement, a proclamation. But you know what's interesting? That same word can be spoken of and used as the point of a sword. And a point of a sword is, is rather intimidating. It's, it's serious when you have the point of the sword at you. So some Bibles simply say testimony, but it's really a proclamation that is very pointed to the issue at hand. So we read, take with you one or two more, meaning one or two more individuals, in order that upon a statement of two witnesses or three, that every word should be established. And what's it talking about here? Truth. That's what we're interested in, that there would be witnesses, and in this case, they would hear Maybe they have witnessed it. They have firsthand uh, evidence of the issue, knowledge personally. Or they hear it and they, they provide a response of what's right or wrong. But the key here is that, that this word should be established. What word? The word of, of truth. The word that relates to the purposes and the will of God. Now look at verse 17. But if he, he will not hear them, say to, and it's a word for church, the congregation, say this to the church, but if also the church, this one won't, won't hear, it says, let him be to you as a, and this word means, many Bibles may say heathen or Gentile. What it literally means is one who has a, a no covenant relationship with God. That this one has proven that he does not have a right relationship with the living God. So treat him as a, a person without a covenant with God or as, as it says here, a tax collector. What's that? One who has forsaken the covenant people in, in behalf of the enemy who have joined in this context the Roman Empire. Truly, I say to you, verse 18, whatever you shall bound upon the earth, and this is a very important statement, we need to get this right. Whatever you shall bound upon the earth, literally it says, it will be. Why will it be? It says, and every translation, and look at commentators, they don't pick up on this. This next phrase where it says, having been bound in the heaven. Notice how he translated that. Having been bound, it's that same perfect. And what does the perfect speak of? Something that was true in the past, it's true now, and it will continue to be true on into the future. So when we go, notice what it says, whatever you bound upon earth, it will be. Why? Because it has already been bound upon earth in the heavens and what is that speaking to it's speaking with to us that we're supposed to agree with god did you hear that we're supposed to be ones what we bind is supposed to be bound in light of the will of god the purposes of god what god's word reveals so this is a scripture that is so frequently taken out of its true meaning look again Whatever you bound upon the earth, it will be having been bound in the heaven. And whatever you shall loose 
set free upon the earth, it will be. Why? Because it has been bound in the heaven. Verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you, and here's the important point, should agree, agree upon the earth. Now, it doesn't say agree with one another. That's very important. What it says here, if you look at it, again, I say to you, why is that word again there? Because it relates to just what we've spoken of in that previous verse about binding and loosening. It says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree upon the earth concerning, and notice this next phrase, so many Bibles say anything. Now, if we look at it, there's actually two words. It is the phrase, when we look at it properly, it's pantos pragmatos. Pantos is the word for every or all. And that's why so many Bibles simply say, if two or three of you agree upon earth concerning anything, then the Heavenly Father is going to bring it about. That is not what it says. Do you think God would simply say because two or three of you agree about something, God is going to obligate himself to do that? I see so many times believers, supposed to be believers, and they agree they want something, and it's certainly not God's will. We need to use a little bit of what's called in Hebrew, sechel, understanding, for interpreting this appropriately. See, the word here, notice what it says. Again, I say to you that if two of you should agree upon the earth concerning every, and the next word is pragmatos. What is that? Well, it's what we get the word pragmatic from. And a pragmatic thing is something that has been investigated thoroughly according to the facts, according to reality. And therefore, one makes a decision, an action, in order that the fact or the desire of one, what's best, shall be fulfilled. And who's that one? Well, notice what it says here in the scripture. If you agree upon earth, two of you, concerning anything, all things that are pragmatic. If you ask, if they ask, it will be done by my Father in heaven. Why is that? Well, we're going to learn next week when we pick up why God will respond and how to properly understand all things that are pragmatic to God according to what he sees as proper. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.